that started to uh, really affect Turkey, kind of rendered the existing policy pretty much outdated. So that the perception, especially in the 90s, was that Turkey didn't have a migration policy. And in many ways, it didn't have one that was adapted to the migration situation uh, uh, at hand. Uh, and what, what happened is, is really that in the period 2000 and 2005, we have a story of very much traditional Europeanization, whereby because of Turkey's EU bid, uh, they had, and, and, and kind of Turkey, uh, uh, EU pressure on that, they had to adopt a, a, a number of rules and regulations uh, in order to fit and harmonize their policy towards migration. Uh, so, so first, like, there was kind of this realization that yes, we need to have some form of migration policy. Uh, and they started to engage kind of as, uh, as part of this very early uh, process in, in immediate reforms and planned very extensively uh, on doing more reforms to really align completely with the Aki. Uh, and this is what they did in 2005. They had this national action plan for the, uh, for the harmonization on, the, on asylum and migration. Uh, and, and so what, what really we saw with all these early reforms is, is this very traditional story of, of, of Europeanization. Uh, you know, Turkey wants to be part of the EU, uh, it, it, which at, at the time kind of looked at the very tangible and possible uh, perspective. Uh, and so it kind of adopted the norms and policy or plans to do so at least accordingly. It was kind of a, of a again, tra traditional normal story. Uh, what happened since 2005 is when, when it got really, uh, really interesting. And, and there are kind of very two interesting, uh, slightly separate stories that, that are happening. Um, one is that since in 2008, uh, the, within the Ministry of, of Interior, they created a task force with two inspectors, uh, really in charge of creating a new, a very kind of large scale, comprehensive, and really in depth migration policy, both asylum and migration policy. And they have been extremely active doing so, so that actually uh, by now we have a full draft of a new law on foreigners and a full draft on a new law of asylum, which is actually just ready to go to the parliament. They're just waiting for the uh, elections to be over to actually present it to the parliament. And, and, and from, from, for many people, this kind of very active uh, reforms in this field was very surprising in, in the last two, three years. Um, first of all, because many of the Many of the issues regarding, you know, providing more rights to migrants and having a much clearer policy were issues where the Turkish bureaucracy was very, very nervous about in the 90s and in the early 2000s. They really want, didn't want to talk about, they you know, considered this was, this was European pressure and this was not hurt Turkey. And, and there was kind of this sudden, suddenly, the, 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 this apparently same Turkish bureaucracy was suddenly very open and kind of ready to do maybe sometimes even more than what um, what, what the EU would have, would have wanted from them. Uh, it was also very surprising because they used a very open and liberal approach. Like they consulted with NGOs, they consulted with academicians. It was a very open process of, you know, kind of talking with multiple stakeholders and being really open to new ideas and kind of uh, pondering the different arguments, which again surprised a lot of observers. This is not how traditionally Turkish bureaucracy operates when it comes to the new policy. Um, but the most surprising thing is this happens completely independently from the European stake. Uh, most of these reforms that they are actually doing are part of Chapter 2024 uh, on Justice and Home Affairs, which has not been opened. Like this is this is not something that has been open to negotiation. It is not a chapter that has been opened, and and so they have been doing all these reforms completely independently from 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 the kind of more traditional EU pressure and kind of means on, of having an impact on Turkey. So this is kind of the of the, the and, and basically the the new. Again, the, the, the new laws are not passed in the parliament, so we don't know exactly what, what the outcome is going to be. Uh, but if, if it passed, it would actually provide Turkey with a pretty much you know, protective and liberal uh, asylum and migration policy, which, is a, which would be a new and welcome development in many ways. The other interesting story, story that happened since 2005 is the one on visa policy. And you might have heard a lot more about this, because this has been talked a, a, a lot more, and this has more of a direct impact on, on, on foreign policy. Um, but the story is that in 2002-2003, uh, kind of, uh, Turkey, Turkey, Turkey said that they would, um, uh, they would align with the Schengen visa policy as part, again, of this EU bid, which basically meant adopting a whole very expensive uh, list, negative uh, list country, uh, to which they would have to apply new visa regulation and have this kind of restrictive visa policy. Which they did, and they started to align and they started to sign those new visa agreements with, with a lot of country back in 2002-2003. They kind of stopped that policy in 2005, 
And in a very kind of obvious and systematic manner since 2008, 2009, they have been completely reversing this policy and very actively pursuing uh, a policy of, non, of, of no visa. Uh, no visa at all, and you can, they, they have reached this very kind of historic, historically very important agreement with Syria, with Russia. Uh, but basically, basically any time uh, you have a, 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 a Turkish officials going abroad, one of the first thing they talk about with that new country is how can we reach a, a, a kind of a visa-free agreement with, with that country, which is again uh, very interesting. And uh, so the question is why, why is Turkey really doing that? And, and you know, one of the easy answers would just be to say. This, this is not actually related to the EU, they do that completely independently. Actually, if you talk to the people, and this is part of my research, I've been talking a lot with the, with the, the, the bureaucrats in charge of this, this is actually has a lot to do with, uh, with the EU. And basically, what, what there's, what there, and this is where this, this sentence of we are more European than the Europeans is coming up along. They're basically saying all those values on asylum and migration that have been developed either internally as kind of an internal project in the EU or as just part of you know, the, the different declaration of human rights and etc. are the values that we actually are adopting now. And we're having, you know, in many ways, uh, this, open, this, liber this policy of, um, of, of, of no visa and kind of open borders. We are just trying to do the same thing that Europe was doing internally in the 50s and then later on uh, with, the, with the Schengen thing. With the Schengen of having this idea of you know opening the borders is good for stability and prosperity and you know a lot of cultural exchange and societal exchange and kind of interdependence is developing between between those countries. Uh, the same thing with, uh, with 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 migration policy. You know, having a very uh, having a more protective uh, policy and, and liberal one that you know accepts migrants and kind of protects their rights. Uh, and, and basically, what they are saying is. You know, Europe has changed. We don't really know why, but Europe has changed in the last 20 years. They've become, you know, much more security oriented. They are more afraid of migrants. Uh, but we, and they kind of forgot the values that they have about this. We are actually adopting their norms to uh, to to our issue. But so what we are doing is actually we are being, we are really we are we are really being kind of authentic Europeans, and we are not the ones who have forgotten our, our own values. Uh, so the implications on that, I don't think I have a lot of time. Um, I mean, it, it, it's actually, so, so yeah, I've just presented you some evidence that Turkey is becoming, uh, on, on this particular issue, uh, both more European and more independent, which I think is overall a good news for Europe, even though not necessarily, uh, not necessarily an easy one, because in many ways we see Turkey be becoming a more difficult partner, partner well, one which is much more critical, uh, one which is just, you know, it, Turkey used to be this, this kind of uh, very dependent, almost kind of begging country, which was not fully upholding the values, uh, but, but which was kind of you know trying to do whatever. Now you have the contrary; you have a much more self-confident country, which is not afraid of saying no. And you see that also with the uh, Turkey-U.S. relationship. You know, not afraid of saying no because much more confident of its own values and the fact that you know they are right in a way of uh, in, of, of doing what they are doing. Uh, so, so again, I think overall it's a good news with, with, for Europe, even though it's going to be a difficult one. But in in, in practice, this is. I think if Turkey were to become part of the EU, Turkey would become a much more constructive partner, right? One, ones that, that can actually say, look, there are some problems on those particular policies, and this is something you need, you need to, to pay attention to. And, and we are not saying that because we are foreigners and we have different values. We're actually saying that because we really internalize your values, and I think we want to identify, we want to show you that there has been a, a gap between your values and practices in, in, that, in that thing. Uh, but the other kind of important implication is, I think, this understanding of you know, this critical Europeanization is in many ways a very powerful discourse in Turkey. It is kind of both talking to this kind of national pride, you know, that, that you know, to Turkey are able, they, they used to be kind of have this complex of inferiority compared to Europe, and this is kind of changing this, and this is in many ways really empowering and really encouraging for Turkey in terms of engaging in reforms by still kind of providing a framework in terms of not necessarily that the European values are, are the best, but or necessarily that those values are necessarily European uh, as such, but that they are providing this kind of liberal and democratic framework, uh, which can which can be kind of a secure guiding uh, guiding uh, framework in which in which Turkey can involve in, in reforming its policies. And I'll start. After three great papers, it will be an easier job to comment on them. Emiliano Alessandri from German Marshall Fund of the United States. Well, thank you. Um, first of all, of course, thanks to the uh, organizers uh, of this event uh, for the very kind uh, invitation. 
uh, I really enjoyed the three papers which I read uh, very carefully and I'm going to have some specific comments on each uh, later. But I think there is a common thread, a common a red line in a way common to all the three papers and is the following, that in the context of this very uncertain relationship between Turkey and the European Union and in the context of the accession process, all the three authors agree or seem to agree that Turkey has had the chance to redefine its identity and in a way to affirm a new type, <coughs> reaffirm some of the older vocations of Turkey, but also affirm a new type of identity. And that in recent years in particular, this reaffirmation of, of an identity is linked more and more closely to the emphasis on distinctive elements of Turkish society, Tur 